Good evening, everyone. Thanks and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Computer History Museum. I'm John Holler, the CEO, and I'm so pleased to welcome you here tonight on behalf of our trustees, our staff, our members, and so many of our amazing volunteers. Look at this crowd for another night of revolutionaries. It's just wonderful to have all of you here. Steve Jobs grew up, went to high school, built a company, and changed the world less than eight miles away from where we are tonight. Less than eight miles away, yet in another sense, a million miles away. For the essence of Steve Jobs remains exceptionally elusive. And to the extent that we know what we know, or what we think we know, may appear sharp and crisp today, history shows that the outline of every great figure in business or society becomes increasingly hard to discern with each passing year. Those in search of the essential Steve Jobs, and there are a lot of us, are therefore quite fortunate to know Brent Schlender and Rick Tatselli and to have them illuminate this subject so skillfully in their new book, Becoming Steve Jobs, The Evolution of a Reckless Upstart into a Visionary Leader. The title suggests a profoundly personal journey, and the book documents it. With Schlinder and Tetzeli, we are in very skilled hands. Brent covered Steve Jobs for almost 30 years as a writer and editor for the Wall Street Journal and Fortune magazine. They developed not just a relationship as colleagues, but also as friends. Rick Tetzeli is the executive editor of Fast Company magazine and the fellow who took on the formidable task of helping to pull together nearly three decades of notes and audio tapes into a compelling narrative while adding his own skillful reporting along the way. Together, they have produced a candid, insightful, and utterly original work about one of the most complex and intriguing figures of our time. We'll explore all of that and more with them tonight. Please join me in welcoming Brent Schlender and Rick Tetzelli. Welcome. Great. Come Good on here. over. Thanks. Great to have you here. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Yeah. Look at this crowd. Really nice to see all these faces, too. So, you know. All right, so co-authoring a book, co-authoring a book or a, about anyone would be a challenge. But you guys have managed to produce really an amazing, a, an amazing book about Steve Jobs working together. And I want to ask you how you got started on this and how it all worked out. Well, um, Brent and I worked together back at Fortune Magazine, um, I, where I edited a lot of his stories about Steve back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and then I took a detour and went to Entertainment Weekly, and I went to, uh, and now I'm at Fast Company, um, and uh, we we became we had become close friends and. And, and stayed in touch, and um, <coughs> we started working on a, on a story for uh, Fast Company, because Brent called me up one day and said, oh, I've got all these tapes uh, that I just found, and um, I haven't transcribed them. So um, we didn't know what they were, so we went back and got them transcribed and converted to digital, and he had to find them in, you know, these storage cases and um, anyway we started working on the on the on the this cover story for fortune that was built around what had happened during the years that Steve was away from uh, away from Apple and it went really well I was really enjoying it again working working together was really great and so I called Without Brent knowing, I called his agent and I said, um, "Are you still interested in that book by Brent Schlender that you've wanted for 20 years <laughs> about Steve Jobs?" And she said, "Duh." And uh, so, so uh, we we said, "Okay, well that would be interesting," and we started working on the article. And then I was at my uh, daughter, uh, at my son's softball game one Sunday afternoon, and I 
called Kathy Cook, who's here in the Valley and who had worked with us at Fortune. And, I, and this is the way Fast Company works. And I said, I've totally forgotten to do any PR for this issue. And it was coming out on Monday. Um, and so, so Kathy helped out, and, and we found all these folks uh, to get some social media buzz rolling. And uh, so on Monday, the story went out to 10 people. By Wednesday, it was being read in Vietnam and all this sort of stuff. On Thursday morning, we wrote a book proposal in half an hour. And on Friday, we had a contract. <laughs> um, and it, there was clearly more than one publisher interested in it. I can't remember how many it was, but yeah, it was more than one. <laughs> so Brent, how, how much tape did you have? How many interviews had you done with Steve over the Well, years? I had 50, roughly 50 cassettes uh, of just for Steve. And some of those, it took a couple of them to cover a single interview. Others uh, were just a single one per interview. And I just kept these over the years. I didn't record every time I talked to him because we spoke a lot over the phone, just uh, spontaneously for various reasons. And those weren't really considered interviews, so I just didn't record them. But, but I had forgotten just how often we would talk at length, and or I'd go into his office, and I'd always bring the tape recorder and plop it down there, and so I, I just had kind of lost track of how many of these I had over 25 years. But I guess it sort of makes sense, and um, and they were they were interesting because Steve would always he didn't mind me recording him, and so I would put the he got to know my tape recorder really well. <laughs> he knew where the pause button was, and. <laughs> And so when there was something he didn't want me to accidentally repeat, uh, he would hit the pause button and then he'd start telling me his scurrilous story or whatever it would be that didn't want other people to hear. And then I'd say, Steve, when can I uh, unlock the pause button uh, to make sure that he you know, would do it himself so that we would be all clear on whether that was off the record or not. And so that became kind of a little, it wasn't a game, but it was something he always smiled when he did it. And he was boom, like that. And I mean, that's one of the things, you know. Well, you're an archivist dream. And we have lots of archivists here who are very proud of the fact that you kept that archive. And uh, it's, now, it's now part of the record. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. Well, I'm just glad that I found them. <laughs> Talk about, Brent, if you would, talk about the first time you encountered Steve Jobs, the very first time. The very first time I, the, the, I had any encounter with him was, interestingly enough, Kathy Cook was involved with that too. I had just moved to the Bay Area um, uh, for the Wall Street Journal, something I'd been angling to do for a while, and uh, because I'd studied some computer science in, in college, and and even though I was an English major, and nobody else at the Wall Street Journal knew that much about, about computers. And so I thought, well, geez, you know, maybe I should hold my hand up for that. And I finally wangled my way there. And literally within a week after I got here, we got the call from, from Next and saying that Steve was ready to start talking about his new venture that had been sort of in quiet mode for six months since he initially started it after abruptly leaving Apple. And, uh, and he wanted to just share a little bit of what it was all about uh, with a few of the major publications. Well, the Wall Street Journal is one of the major ones, so we got a call. And so I showed up there, not, but not until after the night before meeting with all my peers that my Bureau, who had traded the job of trying to write about computers out here, and they all told these horror stories about this guy that uh, was really kind of a difficult interview. And they said, you know, wear your flak jacket, and uh, uh, which was actually not that absurd because you know I'd actually done that before in, in Latin America. But at any rate. <laughs> 
Uh, so I went down there and I was, I was really kind of apprehensive because this guy was younger than me by about a year. And, and not only did his reputation precede him, but I just was kind of baffled by what it was going to be like to interview somebody kind of my own age who's already had his face on Time magazine and has been and who's like the, considered one of the fathers of personal computing and much less the, the reputation he had for being difficult. And um, so I was, I was kind of nervous, to tell you the truth, when I got there. And, and um, I met him and went upstairs and he told Kathy to leave. He doesn't like to have PR people around all the time and started interviewing me. Uh, <laughs> And uh, that took about 20 minutes before he satisfied himself that I might kind of know maybe a little bit about what he was talking about, and so went from there. But it was a, it was a, I won't call it cordial because we didn't know each other yet. But he was, he let me know what he wanted me to know, and he extracted from me what he wanted to know about me. So, <laughs> I, uh, and that's the opening, it's actually the opening vignette in the book, which is a really wonderful way to begin it. Rick, in a second, I want to ask you about the cooperation you got from an extraordinary circle of friends and associates. But before I do, I'm going to show everyone here in the audience a picture, which is of a very young Brent Schlender and a very young Steve Jobs. You talk about this in the book. This is an employee picnic. Of, uh, of Next Employees in 1987. Clearly, you guys had known each other for a bit, but not that long. Your daughter, Greta, and you're just sort of relaxing on, hey, Bill's having a chat. What, how did that go? Oh, it was, uh, Steve was trying to uh, become more humane in the early days at Next, and so <coughs> he decided once a year he would put on a great family-style picnic for everybody. Really nice thing that he did, and he had hired the Pickle Family Circus, and uh, and you know, one of the odder things was that he they served hot dogs, and you know everybody knows Steve is a vegan, but um, uh, we had hot dogs and and bag races and all those kinds of things, three-legged races even, and um, so it was he really enjoyed this obviously, and he wanted me to come, and he wanted me to bring my kids, and so that I could see how. This is a really different kind of company that he was starting, and that's what we were doing there. And he had this little fancy tent pavilion with the hay bales, and we just sat there most of the time while the kids played and the circus performed and all that. But and he just kind of held court. I like this because <clears throat> you shared, you both shared with us a number of photographs that you you have assembled, many of which are in the book. But this is just, I think emblematic of a theme that comes up again and again, which is your personal relationship. And I think that gets reflected um, through, throughout the narrative. So. Rick, you guys had the extraordinary cooperation of a very tight circle of people who really had not spoken very much to anyone about any of this. So can you talk a bit about that, how it happened and well, how that we influenced you? When we, when we started out, Apple didn't want to have anything to do with us. Um, uh, we started the project about nine months after uh, Steve had died. Um, they had cooperated with one book. Um, and um, as far as I could tell at the time, they were done cooperating on books. And um, so, you know, I only met uh, Jobs twice in my uh, once in a group setting uh, at Fortune, and once with Brent when he had that little barn office down in downtown uh, Palo Alto. And, um, and so the first thing that happened was we started interviewing around Apple, of course, and with people who had, um, who had, who had worked for him at Next and at Apple and Apple the first time around. And um, the thing that really surprised me and was sort of the beginning of my education in this process was to hear these people talking about him in the present tense um, 
two out of the three, two out of the three first people we interviewed cried during the interview. We then set out to try to get everybody we interviewed to cry. Um, no. Um, and, um, and I, and, and to me, it, it was, um, it was, it was really interesting because um, the reason I wanted to do the project from the beginning was that he seemed like a more complicated, um, uh, rounded guy than had been portrayed um, over the years. And even that, you know, when I was editing Brent um, from far, far away as an editor, um, you know, on the one hand, Brent would talk about what they had talked about. On the other hand, uh, you know, I'd get a call or my boss would get a call usually from Steve complaining about the photo, complaining about some language, complaining about, you know, the timing of the publication and complaining about why we weren't doing the story. And, and those things sort of reinforced the stereotype for me. So that was sort of the beginning of the exploration for me. And it, it was a, it, it was a, a it was an incredible group of people around him. Um, we started with Apple. Finally, um, came around uh, in. Uh, they told us in August. Uh, they told they told us at one point that they would cooperate. Then we didn't hear anything, and then um, all of a sudden we had interviews um, in a week, and um, and those interviews uh, were really. Great. We talked. They, they came after our actual deadline for the manuscript was due, right. had passed. <laughs> and and, so and being we, a good journalist, got, you never missed a deadline, right? Ever. <clears throat> oh no, we're really good at meeting deadlines, and uh, we we were dragging our feet a little bit on purpose, just kind of hoping, because they had told us, and you know, I think it was October of right. 2013 that. Yeah, we're considering this. Could you please send me a note to each one of these people directly so that I can see what you want to ask them? This was from Katie Cotton. And um, so I sent that and never heard a word for another four months. Until April. And then, we, and then didn't, we, had the we didn't see in them until April, and we were supposed to be done. We talked them. to all four um, of the employees who went to Steve's um, private burial service. And... Um, and at that point, we had, we had really, um, in, in some ways, I felt we had done what we set out to do in our manuscript, which was the reason we got into this was to show his change as a businessman and how he learned lessons. That was our primary goal. We were writing a business book. And we felt like you know, that hadn't been documented. And that Steve didn't help with that process in any way during his lifetime because he never liked to say, oh, I learned this from so-and-so, or Ed Catmull taught me that, or, you know, thank you so much, so-and-so, for, 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 you know, helping me out with that. And so you had to sort of go back and reconstruct it and see how he had handled things at Apple the first time or at Next and how he handled them when he went back. Getting these interviews at the end, I think Apple had decided. Apple decided, you know, based on their relationship with Brent, that um, this book might be more rounded than. And as they've made clear in the publicity, you know, they they weren't happy with other things, and and so. So those interviews were really, really personal and intense, and um, and just just great. I'm glad you did what you just did <clears throat> because you've, you're transitioning us from the how to the why, and why you wrote this book in the first place. And there's a great passage early on which said that you you are seeking to provide a fuller picture and a deeper understanding. Now, can you just say, I think you, you, you started to describe it a bit, but can you say what that fuller picture and that deeper understanding needed to be in, in your eyes as a, as a biographer? Well, I had, and Rick agree, I'm sure would agree with this, I had my own thoughts about it just from observing. I've written a lot about businesses over the years, and so I know 
that the process of creating and managing a business is as much art as science. And it's a very creative process. And so, and there are difficult decisions to be made and also unpredictable uh, challenges that pop up that you have to react to. And so the whole thing is, uh, is kind of like playing a jazz solo in that you have to be both very creative, you have to know what's going on, you have to know the context of everything, and yet every situation is different and you have to react to that. And so there's a story there in how people learn how to do that. Some people are better than others. And Steve struck me as somebody who's zigged and zagged at unpredictable times that, as he got older, seemed to be just the right time. And so there had to have been something that he learned besides being a bully, besides being golden tongue, where he really had learned something about motivating people and about making decisions on technologies and products, on how to promote them, and many, many different decisions like this that were very, very sophisticated and just were not reflected in anything mm. I'd read before. Mm. So that was the, the, the goal, to write a really great business book about how this guy's mind worked when it came to dealing with business challenges and faced with decisions. And, uh, and coincidentally, when we did get to talk to Apple, this was exactly what Tim Cook was telling us was on Steve's mind the last few years, that, that he was much more interested in letting people around him know the why of what he did. And he wanted people to learn why he did these things, not just the, how he did the decision, but why? Yeah. Because he thought that's what needs to be replicated to perpetuate the company. That's, that's what he brought that was unique and that he thought that's something that could be imparted to others. So it turned out to be kind of a nice coincidence once we were able to talk to each other because Rick and I were thinking in exactly these terms and Tim was sitting there telling us that, that he was so much fascinated in the why of it all that he set up Apple University and that they do these post-mortems on not just great decisions, but mistakes. And that they really methodically attacked that. And so that confirmed to me that we were right. This guy was, was more sophisticated as a, as a businessman who learned and developed uh, than most people thought. The book unfolds at a tremendously rapid pace, and it's just, it's such a great read. And I have arbitrarily, for the purposes of tonight's conversation, divided up into four chapters or four segments, if you will. The first is his stormy last seven years during his first tour mm -hmm. of duty at Apple. Then the wilderness years, that's your phrase, yeah. from 1985 to 1977, 1997, which turns out to be such a key part, a real mm -hmm. central focus of the book. That brief period from 97 to 2000 when he's just trying to save Apple as a company. Mm -hmm. And then that explosive decade from 2001 until his death in 2011. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me explore those four just in a minute. I'm gonna, I think we ought to actually spend the least amount of time on the first one, that's been so well yeah. documented, and that kind of it was a real it was a real challenge for us as 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 writers, what to do about those early years, because <coughs> we both, um, I think, um, as writers, really wanted people to get hooked and dive into this story and to you know, be able to read this as a, as a story, as something you could sit down and enjoy. And, and um, you know, Brent met uh, Steve in 1980, uh, 1986, right? In 86, right. In 86, right. In 86, so um, he missed those, those first Apple years, and there's been so much written about those years, going back to, you know, Mike Moritz, um, uh, who wrote a wonderful book about about uh, the little kingdom? The little kingdom, and so we really wrestled with that. And at one time, and at one point, even began the book in 1986. But then we realized that <coughs> in showing how he changed 
The more we reported, we realized you could look at decisions that were made at Apple and what had happened with teams at Apple, and you could see parallels in the later years. And so they were, it was very useful in terms of sort of setting up, um, you know, you had to know where, where he started um, as a manager. And, um, you know, it was, it was fascinating. I mean, he was quite terrible in, in many ways. Yeah, you have this great phrase that you use, tyrant savant. Yeah. Well, he was, you know, I think that, I think that, I, I, I think that the, the, the thing that I came to understand was that, you know, um, he, was, he was really brilliant at rallying a small group of people for one project for a few months. And then if that project started to not pan out, he'd walk away from it. Um, and, you know, and, and, and even, with, even with the Mac, um, you know, the, pro, the, the Mac came out, it was underpowered when it came out. It only became a real, you know, it was a, it was, it was a brilliant debut. It was showmanship when he introduced it. And then, you know, and then it took Scully to make it into, you know, a product that started selling and, you know, and became the mainstay. So once you dig in there, um, it's, it's sort of fascinating to watch. And both of us have spent a long time looking at how people run companies. And, and um, it was, there, he, made, he made many, many mistakes. And that was the thing. How could that... that Sometimes it's port he's portrayed, we all say Steve was X. Steve Jobs was X. Well, you know, he was X in 1983 and he was Y in, you know, 2005. And, and how do you, th those early years, you can really see the failures very clearly. Yeah. On the other hand, we, Rick and I talked a lot about this as we were trying to lay out the book. And that, what, the big question that we, sort of a philosophical one we talked about together was, what is change? How do people really change? Do they really change? Do they, I mean, are they completely different? And there, you know, after you think about it a while, you realize, well, no, you can't change stripes for spots. You, you are who you are, and you have the strengths you have. And you do have blind spots and weaknesses that you need to contend with. What changes is managing how those affect your performance and, and make more use of what you're good at and minimize or mitigate the things that get you into trouble if you can. And that, to me, is what growth is. And, that, and that's also, maybe some people call it maturity, too. But, so we, we finally realized, well, yeah, Steve changed, but it's not like he changed his hair color or he changed his shirt, you know, which he did. But it was really more that he just, you can really see how he learned how to, how to rein in some of his uh, overwrought tendencies and, and make people make it easier for people to work with them. There were some phrases that came up along the way. Um, I think it was Daniel Lewin who talked about um, charismatic leadership. And, um, and Jim Collins talked about um, jobs initially as a leader with a thousand followers. And, um, you know, Collins thinks, thinks jobs changed from that um, and matured significantly. And, and then the charismatic leadership part was always there. It's just a question of how he, uh, how he adapted, how he changed, how he, how he, how he was more effective yeah. in that way over the years. Let's talk about the, one of the major change periods that you go through, which is that period after he leaves Apple while he's trying to do two pretty superhuman things at the same time. One is start next and build a whole new computer company, and the other is give birth to Pixar. So what's your theory about why he insisted on trying to do both of those things at the same time? Well, I think some of it was just circumstantial, that, that he, 
he had liked the idea of working with the team from, that turned into Pixar long before he left Apple. And by long, I mean it was the spring of, of, of 1985 that he first went and took a look and talked to George Lucas about it. George Lucas needed to raise some money for personal reasons and, and was trying to figure out what parts of Lucasfilm he didn't really need, or Industrial Light and Magic, he didn't really need that he could raise a little cash from. And Steve tried to get Apple to buy it, and they just nobody, he was already rubbing people the wrong way by then, and, and he just didn't, couldn't get the board to pay much attention to it. So, and this has been gnawing inside of him because he really liked these guys and he liked their technology. He wasn't quite sure what it was good for, but he knew it was, it was kind of special. And, uh, you know, Steve did have a good eye for things like that. And so after he left Apple, it turned out the, that a couple of other deals that Lucas had, had tried to, to drive for that group that fell through and Steve heard about it and so he went back again and Steve is nothing if not a great negotiator even then and he drove a really hard bargain and he managed to pry it loose and so it's not as if he thought he needed to do that it's just it, it was just he did not want to let it slip through his mm -hmm. fingers and he'd figure out something later and he also knew that he wouldn't have to manage it completely that they, they were perfectly capable of managing themselves mm -hmm. to, to some extent. And so they just needed well, he a, had to, a godfather and a sugar daddy, basically. Yeah, yeah. He had to accept that. I mean, well, he learned, he really learned to. He, he, really, he had to, yeah. 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 Do you think he did that willingly at that point in his career? Do you think it was oh, no. a, a choice? No, 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 no. I think, I mean, it, you know, I think, I think he, 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 he did all sorts of things there. They had a business plan where they were going to sell, I believe, medical imaging um, <laughs> equipment, um, and they hired um, uh, a whole a whole slew of um, sales guys um, to sell into the hospitals. And then they uh, had to fire them. I think two years after they hired them, and that was all uh, Steve's idea. Um, it's it's. Um, it's interesting to, 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 to watch him, to see him at Next, because it's the, it's the same, you know, he, he went away, we had this, I think it was Susan Barnes who said that he went away that summer and he came back and he was really talking about how he had learned all these lessons and he was gonna change. And then he really didn't change, uh, you know. And you can see the same sort of um, frenetic energy that went into, um, the Lisa and some other some other projects that didn't work out, um, and it's you know we we talked about this a lot. I mean the 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 drive for revenge, the drive to outdo Apple was so inter seems although he would deny it all the time uh, seems so obviously intertwined with you know the desire to. Uh, serve the education market, which is what he said he wanted to do, but really he wanted to create a great box that nobody else could create and he was going to outdo everybody. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it, it's just sort of, you know, it was, it was, it was fascinating and it got, and it, and it grew really frustrating for all the people from Apple who moved over to next with him, you know, they all eventually, I think everybody eventually left. I was struck actually, Brent, by the number of interviews that you quoted in that section when he's trying to build next and how many times he's referring to Apple. It seems like in almost every interview, as you're talking about it, he's referring back to Apple or he's comparing something that's being done was something Apple is doing. Was, was that well, a characteristic that was really of it? Well, that was really his only reference point. I don't think it's just that he was obsessed with it, which he probably was, but um, it's, that's his reference. That's all he knew. That, this is the thing that people forget about Steve, is that he got out of, you know, he, he spent a year or a half a year in college. He went to India. He worked for Atari. He, he, but that was not a real, like, very corporate job by any means. 
And so his only experience with anything had been really Apple. And so everything, that was his yardstick. And yeah, he'd gotten run out of Apple, but it was still his yardstick. Mm. Or at least his ideal of it was his yardstick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, it just by default what he would always compare things to. You know, uh, our cover picture, uh, the cover photo was taken by Doug Menuez. And um, <clears throat> he has um, this book, Fearless Genius, out with a lot of <coughs> photos from that period. And I noticed that the caption on one of them uh, where um, Jobs is out in a field with a soccer ball is um, Steve is trying to be human. And, uh, or Steve playing at being human at, at that point, which is harsh. Um, but but there, there's, um, it is as if, you know, that Apple period had an, it happened in this intense rush. Those years were crazy. And then he got to the next, and, and it was almost like, you know, that was where he could, he could uh, try out being a leader and uh, trying out being a real leader. He had only been CEO of Apple for two months, um, you know. And he kept, he kept butting up against reality, you know. I, I, we interviewed Scott McNeely, which, you know, is always fun. And, uh, and who he was competing against. Who he was competing at, against, you know, and, and McNeely said, no, we were never worried about them because they understood the workstation market so much better than, than Jobs did. I want to talk during these wilderness years about two pretty transformational relationships, as it turns out, that Steve had. The first is with Ed Catmull. We have a picture of Ed, uh, for those of you who don't, no, probably one of the one of the most amazing business executives in America who's so obscure. He is a fellow of the museum, I will say that. Um, who was the who was the CEO of Pixar? And you talk about you talk about the experience that Steve had with Pixar and the relationship he had with Catmull in particular, and you write Without the lessons he learned at Pixar, there would have been no second great act at Apple. Can you talk a bit about this relationship and how it shaped him? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's why, um, it, the thing about doing this book is that, you know, it's the first book we've done. I never want to work on a book that isn't about somebody fascinating <laughs> because, you know, you're, we're, here we are, we finished the book and we're still trying to figure him out in some ways. And if you look at the intersection of, of, of what happened at Next and what happened at Pixar, um, you know, over at Next, he's trying to be a leader. He's trying to be a professional manager. I mean, he, he talked some serious nonsense during those years about what it meant to be a CEO. I mean, you know, it, it, I look back at Brent's notes and stories from the time, and you know, he's talking about President Noriega and what he should do, you know? And, and the thing is that, so over here, he's trying to do it all on his own. And over at Pixar, he can't. He can't do it on his own because Catmull had already created a great culture there. Uh, they, had, they had survived very difficult years. They had, they, they had, they had missed out on a, a bunch of different possibilities for their computing. And he was held at bay over there. And, and he got to see Catmull as a, pay, as a manager who had patience as a manager who successfully managed an incredibly creative team, Steve had an amazing team at Next, an amazing group of creative people. But he could, he could excite them, but he couldn't bring them together as a group and ma making steady progress. Catmull knew how to do that, and Catmull held them together. And then he saw Lassiter, and, his, and the animators make Toy Story. And that was a long project of, of, of sort of, you know, all kinds of dead ends, you know? They, they, um, they shut down the movie for two months at one point. Um, 
you know, Katzenberg wanted a different approach, um, and yet they fought through, and this is again, Cap, Catmull says, at some point, all our movies suck. And, and he learned how to do that. Yeah. And that's what you see when he goes, when he goes back. He had never, ever been exposed by any previous mentor to that kind of, that kind of long-term patience and success. Well, there's a group perseverance he witnessed yeah. too that, that came from, from really the way these people respected each other and got along with each other, the way the work was divided at Pixar. This is a, an industry where in most movies, it's a band of gypsies that come together and they work together and they fight and end up making a movie. And then they scatter to the wind. This was a different process altogether. And making, a, making an animated movie is all, you edit it first and then you make it. And so it's, it's a much more disciplined process and it really benefits from doing it over and over again. And Ed was really good at keeping these people together and getting through the nightmarish process of working for four years on one of these things and going up and down and up and down and coming out the other end. And then turning around and doing it again. And this was a huge epiphany for Steve that you saw in action back at Apple once basically the start of iTunes was sort of the beginning of it where you began to see this, where they would really stand on their shoulders each, each step of the way. And it was very much like what Pixar did. So if Catmull is the patient, self-aware CEO that he's learning from, the other relationship, which really I think in the book you portray is a very tender relationship, is the relationship between Jobs and John Lasseter. We have a picture uh, here. This is the 2005 Oscars where Pixar is winning the Oscar for The Incredibles. That's John standing in the front there with his suit and his wife, Nancy next to him. You can see Steve photobombing the entire group yeah. there in the back, which is really, really that, fun. That is not a photo that we could have published uh, in the past. <laughs> uh, I, I want to talk a bit about the creative genius that he saw in Lassiter uh, that rubbed off on him in the other way. I would say that Lassiter... Well, Lasseter became a very good, dear, dear, dear friend of Steve. They loved each other. So there's that, too, that came from it. But John is such a fun guy to be around. Everybody loves to be around him. Uh, uh, that, so that's not surprising to me. But their relationship, in some ways, is sort of like what Steve's was with Johnny Ive, except with Johnny Ive, they were actually working together and, and creating together. Steve was just sort of happy to be able, it's just like that picture. Mm. He's, he was happy to be there and to be able to watch this guy at work and see what he could do because he just couldn't imagine how you could do that. And there's, there's a little bit of that with Johnny too, where Johnny knows with these Johnny materials, Ive. Johnny Ive, yeah, and knows, knows materials and process and all these things intimately that, that Steve doesn't know. But there they was more of a self-reinforcing thing in their relationship. But there was a certain similarity to it where they both just get this deep, deep, deep thrill out of watching each other work. Tell the story, if you would, about Steve and John Lasseter and John's worn-out Honda. You want to tell that one? Uh, well, it's great. You know, uh, he, uh, um, Lasseter had built a house up in... Um, Glen Allen. Where? Glen Allen. Glen Allen. And uh, so he invited um, uh, Steve and, and Laureen up. And um, so they went up there. Um, the first night they stayed up till uh, 3 a.m. or so, and uh, this was uh, this was 90, 
five, right? Yeah, this 95. is his first house. He built another house. <laughs> <a little bit. laughs> it was 95, and he stayed up till 3 a.m. and, and um, basically Jobs taught Lasseter um, all about uh, uh, the stock market. Um, stock options. Because he was getting and ready stock, to take and stock options. Pixar Public. Yes, he was getting ready to take Pixar Public, and, and Lasseter thought this was... Uh, slightly crazy, and he wanted to know why not, and you know. And then the next day, they were sitting out on the porch, and they're and and they have a beautiful view, and there's Lassiter's car, um, which is a rundown old wreck. I think he said he had thrown his coats over the over the over the chairs so no, it was t-shirts the t-shirts over the uh, chairs over the seat backs. because they were all gnarled up and you know it's an old honda it was an old honda yeah. and um and and steve had driven up there from cupertino the day before and so he he thought he was like you drive that every day and um and and as Lassiter told us, you know, he was probably thinking, and there goes my animator. Um, and so he said, he said, that's not going to do anymore. Uh, you got to buy a new car. And um, so he, um, he said, he said, you got to buy a new car. I have to approve it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and the next paycheck um, that uh, Lasseter got, and subsequent paychecks after it, included a small bonus for his for car payments on, I think, the Audi. It was an Audi or a Volvo? Uh, it was a Volvo. It was a Volvo. Something really safe. Uh, Volvo, yeah, that, the Volvo that Steve had approved. Yeah. yeah. I love that story. Well, right. there's a similar story that I can tell because go I for used it. to go over to Steve's house on Saturdays sometimes. Because um, the kids learning and the kids may be gone or something, and he'd, he'd call up and say, Hey, I want to talk about something. Why don't you come on over? And uh, sometimes it was about something really serious. Sometimes he just, I don't know, he just wanted to talk. So I went over there once, and I, at this time I was driving an old 19, you would not believe this, it was a 1978. Toyota Celica. I mean, this car was like wasn't that the most stolen car in America old. at one point? Huh? The most stolen car in America at one point, I think, was a uh, 1978 I Celica. I don't know. This one, this one was actually kind of cool when it was new, but oh. it wasn't new. It, <laughs> uh, and, it, and I mean, the paint was like no, it was like flat, flat, flat it was gray. Not, it was me. not cool. So, anyway, <laughs> terrible. And um, so he walked me out to the car after we'd been, I can't remember what it was we were talking about, something to do with uh, probably Apple at that time, uh, because he was very unhappy with the way things were going there. And I was trying to do a story on Apple uh, for Fortune at the time. So he came out and just to say goodbye and see me out. And he looked at me walking towards this awful looking car. You know, it's kind of like John's. And uh, he said, you drive that? <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, cost me 50 bucks. And, and he said, you're kidding me. You, you take your kids to school in that? And I said, well, yeah, when I, when I have to. You know, when Lauren can't take them, I'll take that. And, I, and he said, well, that doesn't have airbags. <laughs> and, and I said, no, they didn't have airbags back then, Steve. And he said, well, you can't have a car like that. And so this is, he, we've heard stories like this from actually many, many people about he, how he'd tell you how to run your life and what, what you ought to do. Right down yeah. the car you do. What you should be driving, so. I, I want to take one small digression before we get to the, tri the triumphant return of Steve Jobs to Apple. In 1991, Brent Schlender did one of only two interviews that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates ever did face-to-face. -face. The occasion was the 10th anniversary of the PC. We have a picture of these three young men standing in Steve Jobs' backyard, right? right yeah. Because you did the interview at Steve's house. Right, yeah. Uh, and you draw such an incredible 
contrast between the two of them. Obviously, in 1991, they're in very different positions in their careers. You describe it as still Steve. Yeah, let's go on this way. Let's go on this. The revolutionary, but there's not a yeah. revolution happening for him. And Gates, in fact, even says, I'm on the evolutionary path. Talk about that, that interview and, and your judgment about writing about the two of them. Well, first, in general, I was surprised at how cordial's the wrong word, how playful the conversation was because they, these guys obviously respected each other and they, they're very different in temperament and different in personality, but they have great respect for the, each other's success. And back then, you know, Steve was, was really kind of fighting the image of perhaps being a has-been, where Bill at that point, this was 1991, it was almost as if he had won. Uh, he, he was going to be worth a billion dollars a little bit later that year. Uh, actually, no, he was already worth a billion dollars by the, now that I think about it. But, but his, his notion about the standardizing Windows computer really opened up the possibilities of, of turning the computer, personal computer, into something even more than something merely personal, that it was an architecture capable of subsuming many computers, even mainframes possibly, as long as the, 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 the scale uh, or the, the economies of scale that, that you could get from this architecture was so great that he was just on the cusp of this. And of course, from then on, it was, it was just a juggernaut. Uh, it wasn't quite there yet when this happened, but it was just about there. And Steve had been trying and trying to convince Bill to write software for his next computer, which had maybe sold 30,000 units by then. And, and Bill suddenly was, you know, that's just, those, those numbers don't even register to him. And so that was sort of their, their issue that they had at that time. And during the conversation, uh, they took pot shots at each other about that. And, and, uh, and Steve would tell Bill, well, you know what, I think you make computers that are a lot less good than they could be. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Bill would, would say, well, but we sell a whole lot more of them than you do. And, <laughs> And then they started talking a little more philosophically about it, and Steve said, you know, this what this industry needs is that you need to punctuate the equilibrium now and then in order to really move forward. You cannot move forward incrementally. You got, you got to really punch it forward now and then. And Bill said, I just completely disagree with that. <laughs> and you know, the, the best way, and it's best for your customers, it's best for everybody, is to, is to steadily, incrementally improve these things because it's amazing what you can do and the, and the uplift that you get from Moore's Law and everything else. He said, you, we, we, we have a whole lot more we can do and the software developers can do a whole lot more just working with the same platform. And so back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, uh, and Steve finally said, well, what I really don't like about your platform is that you force everyone to go through this single orifice to program their software. And Bill looked at him and he said, it's a very big orifice. <laughs> <laughs> and they both about fell out of their chairs. It, was, it just was too funny. They couldn't believe they were talking like that. So. So it was fun, and uh, the, the photo that I should have given that to you too, of the, the, that we shot, that we used on the cover of Fortune, was just it's priceless, it's my favorite of them all. And I have them sitting on Steve's stairway in his house, this is a curving stairway. And, and Steve's sitting here, he's a little bit higher, because of course it's his house. He's sitting there, wait, 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 once they first sat down, we, we said, Steve, you don't have any shoes on. And so he ran upstairs and got some shoes, put them on, but he didn't bother to tie the laces. So, so he's sitting there and his shoelaces are untied. And he's like, <laughs> I guess. And then Bill has got this cock 
face looking like the cat who ate the canary. And so the two of them, their personalities really come flying out. And that's what the whole day was like. Yeah. It was really fun. I want to set the stage for his return to Apple just by concluding what you talked about with where Microsoft went from there. So from 1991 to 2000, Microsoft's revenue went from 1.2 billion to 23 billion. Its profit went to 9.4 billion and its stock price increased 3,000%. So here is Steve Jobs uh, back at Apple. And I wanna, I wanna ask you, first of all, uh, because you'd covered him so closely, were you surprised at the time that he made that decision to go back? Well, I saw him a lot during those months after he sold the company. And, uh, and I know personally that he was very, very ambivalent about it, wasn't sure. His wife has told us this too, that, that he was not, a lot of people thought that he'd schemed to do, set this whole thing up so that he could slide, come riding back in on a white horse. And you know, Avi Tavanian, who was the, the, the closest one to him that he took to Apple when they sold Next, says the very same thing, that he just, he really did not have that in mind because it just looked like an impossible job. And he just wanted to give his guys a way out and so they could cash in their stock options because Next had never gone public. And so it was a way for them to get some money back themselves. And it was also a way for him to pay back Cannon and Ross Perot, who had invested a lot of money. And then Steve would finally come clean for, for all that money he got. So that's what he was looking for more than anything. And I think, I remember though, going over there and he was, and he became, disenchanted by just how, how bad the morale was, as he found there. And that's what began to make him think, mm -hmm. well, maybe I should. And then his wife was very instrumental, too. Laureen would say, Steve, you won't be happy unless you try. And, uh, and, and she, she was right. And uh, so she didn't stand in his way either. And it just took him a while to get used to the idea and think that maybe he really could save this basket case. And uh, so that's how that worked. And Rick, you touched on something earlier that I'd love for you to talk about right now, which is an amazing senior team that he had and assembled at Apple, and then his ability now to connect all those dots and really marshal everything he'd learned to begin to go back and start to make it work at Apple. How and why did that, do you explain that in the book about how that happened? Well, I think, you know, you have to remember what Apple's situation was. I mean, I was back in New York editing stories and the only thing I was interested in about Apple at that point was, you know, were they gonna go bankrupt or who was gonna buy them? Um, it was really, um, they were in dire, dire shape. Um, and so I think even if he had wanted to, um, there, the idea of saving the company with one great product was not available to him. That was not something he, he could do. And so he actually, he had had all these months, he had been thinking about Apple for years and then he had all these months of, you know, of, of looking at the company and talking to the board of directors and, and seeing Emilio at work. And he came in and, and made a series of step-by-step -step decisions that were really quite good. And when we, we talked to Lee Clow about Think Different and, and um, you know, he made it clear this was, this was directed at the employees. Um, this was to, you know, a, a, a message to the employees to start, you know, thinking big again. It was a very demoralized workforce. Um, and then, you know, you can, <clears throat> you can look at the whole team is working really well at this point. You know, Fred Anderson is making a lot of great moves as chief financial officer and continuing the, um, the, the sort of 
the layoffs that Emilio had started and the financial restructuring. So the finances of the company are going in the right way. IMAC sort of takes advantage of work that Johnny Ive has done in the past and creates something that draws attention to the company. And suddenly people, you know, people start seeing fun stuff from Apple again. Um, but there was, so there was this stabilization that happened, but it was, it was not a sudden turnaround. I, I think it was Eddie Q who told us that, you know, at one point in, um, I think it was early 2001, he was talking to Jobs and, and, and the stock price was essentially barely up from when Jobs had gotten there, had come back, right? And, you know, it was like they had done all this work. They were still, they still had a 4% market share of the personal computer market. And, and they hadn't broken through. So they had, it was a, it was a period of stabilizing and it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been done by the guy who wanted to create you know, one product and change the world. Yeah. It's to remember back to that time, though, what Steve had actually presided over was the, the shrinking of a company. You know, it, was, it had been laid out. Fred Anderson had the plan, and they knew the numbers they had to reach. But we're talking about a company that had $12 billion in sales before it sort of hit the wall. And now it was half that size, one fourth or one third the number of employees. The, it was not growing, but it was profitable. Apple hadn't been profitable in seven years. So that, you know, they, yeah, they shrunk it, it was smaller, but at least they were in the black mm. for the first time. And so that, that was good. I wrote this story back then called The Graying Prince of a Shrinking Kingdom. And this one really upset him because... <laughs> you because think? Because, <laughs> you know, we took, made him look old in all the pictures and everything. And, <laughs> and these little things magazine people do. And uh, so, but it was true because it, I just said, you know, hey, you got to remember this, this company is not growing. There's something wrong with this picture if it's not growing, and that's why the stock price isn't going anywhere. And uh, I that I just remember that vividly because he called up and he said, "Well, do you have to compare us to Liechtenstein?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Steve. I could have done Monaco. <laughs> so he. He pulls the company back from the brink, and he's doing two things in parallel that you, that you talk about. It, he's stabilizing the company from 97 to 2000, and then, because we, we all lived through it, I think it's just interesting to line up the highlights of everything that happened as you recount in the book. January 2001, iTunes is announced. May 2001, the first Apple retail stores open. October 2001, the iPod is announced. April 2003, the iTunes Music Store opens. October 2003, iTunes for Windows launches. 2004, they upgrade the entire computer product line. 2005, he greenlights the iPhone. June 2007, the iPhone launches. April 2010, the iPad launches. That is, by any stretch, a remarkable period of time for any company, especially That's for one. Also, incrementalism. Exactly. Work. And it's, it's demonstrative, too, of how, you know, Steve always liked this phrase, you just follow your nose. You can only connect the dots in hindsight, he would, he'd say, which is very, very true. You know, you can pretend you can connect the dots looking forward, but you really don't until afterwards. So you just have to trust your instincts and your judgment, and that's what they did. But they also, the other key thing here that people probably don't think about was that Apple switched completely over to a contract manufacturing business, and Tim Cook was the mastermind of all this. He, not only was he good at supply chain and at getting good prices out of parts suppliers, he was great at the logistics of working with contract manufacturers who were all getting better and better, and, then moved to, and in China they were getting more sophisticated. And you think about what they 
also did during that time. They learned how to sell, make products by the millions per month as opposed to the tens of thousands. They learned how to turn the crank on redesigning those things once or twice a year. They learned how to roll out by the five years after that. They could ship 50 million new iPods in time for the launch of, a, of the product. And they'd all be where they needed to be to be sold. This, these logistical challenges are enormous. And Apple got so good at managing all this. And you don't, people aren't, don't think about that. They think about the beauty of the, the brushed aluminum and, the, and the how cool the software is and the user interface, little, the way the windows bounces a little bit. That, well, that's cool too, but they couldn't do it if they couldn't make them. Yeah. And that gave them this whole new possibilities. And that's how the company started to grow. There are two other relationships in connection with that that I want to talk about before we get to audience questions. The first one is his relationship with Johnny Ive. We have a picture of Steve and Johnny sitting at a table together. Rick, what made this such an exceptional thing? I think you should. Uh, go ahead. Well, okay. I, I think that um, I, there are so many things about the relationship that are, are really interesting. Um, they, the thing that, the thing that I've came to appreciate, I think, was that was kind of the relentlessness of the pace, and how that opened up possibility after possibility after possibility. That he he talked about one of my favorite things of, uh, from talking about him was when he talked about how. Um, when you create a product, and this is not something that I had expected to hear from him, when you create a product, there are two great things that come out of it. There's the product itself and everything you've learned in making the product. And the learning is as important as the product. And that speaks to what that team was executing over all these years, you know? Um, as soon as, you know, well before, you know, well before Steve was on the stage introducing the great new product, you know, they'd already decided that the new product, internally they'd decided that the new product was shit and they were gonna start something else, excuse me. Um, and the word gonna, he used, uh, I think you just did a blog post, right? He used that uh, word so effectively in. Somebody and, did, yeah. Yes. Or, or but, um, maybe it was you, Brent. But it was, um, and, and, and this was something that they, um, the, the relentlessness, they both enjoyed that a lot. And it was, and it became, it became his primary work relationship. There was a, a, an element to it, and we actually have this in the book where Johnny explains it, that they were very simpatico in a sort of philosophical sense. They liked to talk in abstractions about the meaning of design. And in ways that just made everybody's eyes roll it was around them at the, in the engineering meetings. And so they finally learned just not to talk philosophically so much during these meetings. But they did when they were together. And it's just one of those things that, that, that they fed each other. And, and, and I think they helped each other realize that, that they were both constantly changing and their aesthetics were constantly changing, that, that they had to be prepared always to change their minds. And this, this was a really very important aspect that is, it's, a, it's sort of a corollary of, of the incrementalism mm. that, that Steve had learned and Johnny had helped show him in some way. Tim Cook had helped show him this, you know, that, that really paid enormous dividends and was a really satisfying part of the way they worked together. And he had learned and he had changed his approach as a result. Well, you, I would ask him questions about to reflect on things and I don't reflect. I once had that, one of the last times I interviewed him was, I can't remember, it was 2010, I think it was, 
And Fortune had decided, I wasn't working for them anymore, but they wanted to make him the businessman of the decade. And, and so give him this award and put him on the cover and give him an excuse to get him on the cover, but he wouldn't talk to them anymore. And so, so they asked me to call up and see if I could get a little something out of him. So I call him and said, okay, Steve, tell, tell me, you know, the lessons that you've learned, <coughs> what you know about leadership now that makes you the greatest businessman of the decade. And, and he said, I never look back. And he said, you know, I really, I don't know why you're asking me these questions because why would I tell you anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so I, okay, well, at least we talked. And <laughs> so I sent it into Fortune and we found a way to get like sort of a, kind of a quote out of him, so, yeah. So the Johnny Ive-Steve Jobs relationship is pretty well known, but there's another that may surprise a lot of people when they learn about it, and that's the relationship between Steve Jobs and Bob Iger. Bob Iger, the head of ABC Disney, Jobs, you document well, had a terrible relationship with Michael Eisner. In fact, said among many terrible things publicly, he would never sell Pixar to Disney. He completely un wanted to undo the entire business relationship with Disney. And then Eisner leaves and Iger comes in and everything changes. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think Iger, um, Iger has shown himself to be a pretty masterful step-by-step CEO in his own right, um, but when he first uh, uh, when he first called um, Steve, uh, which was the day before it was going to be announced that he would be the new CEO, um, Steve didn't know him as anything other than you know Iger's number two guy, and he had been a very good company man. I think that they found. It, it took a lot for Iger to get Steve to trust him. And he worked at it very hard. Um, that f those in the months before he became CEO, um, they worked on, Iger agreed that um, ABC's shows could be on the video iPhone. Um, and they, um, they worked very closely together on that. They talked about um, a lot of different things over that time. And he, that trust, you know, created the foundation of a relationship that then lasted for a long time and became personal. They, um, they really enjoyed spending time together. He came to really respect Iger. Um, and he, um, he respected him so much that right before the Pixar sale um, was about to go through, everybody's gathered in, um, in Emeryville for the announcement. This is in 2006. In 2006, everybody's gathered in Emeryville for the announcement. The PR press is there. Half hour before the announcement, Steve says, hey, let's go for a walk. And he told Iger then that his cancer had come back right before um, this announcement. Now, nobody knew this at the time, aside from his, his wife, wife and his doctors. That was it. And he, he told him and he said, you know, I'm giving you a, an, an out for this deal. And... Um, Iger, and he said, he said, I want to live till Reed's graduation. And um, Iger said, how old is Reed? And um, he had four years, I think, to go at that point. And, he, and Steve told him the expectation that they, he would live five more years. And Iger decided to go ahead with the deal. He decided that Steve was not material to the deal. Um, and he, may, he had to make that decision, as he said, um, you know, in a Sarbanes, Oxley, Enron world. Um, and, uh, in, and he had about three minutes to make the decision. 
So uh, it worked out in the long run, and they and they actually developed a really touching relationship. And um, it was it was. Um, the families became friendly, and he had been warned too by other Disney directors that, oh man, do we really want this guy on our board? You know, he's a tell, he's a know-it-all. He tells everybody when they're full of it. Or do we, he'll be disruptive, and and I said, well, he's going to be the biggest shareholder. <laughs> so you know, he's. Kind of hard to say no, but he's but but Iger by that time felt good enough about their relationship that uh, that he said I I really think you're going to find that he's going to be a great asset to the board, and in fact Iger tells a lot of stories you'll have to read him in the book, but uh, about things that he did to help Disney make a couple of really key decisions and, the, and a lot of time that he put in helping Iger uh, work on certain decisions like related to their retail stores that they had bought back and one about uh, cruise ships. There are a lot of interesting ways in which Steve basically gave Iger the, 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 the really the, the muscle in a way and the insight that he needed to win over the board. But he did have to, he, Iger did tell us he had to like kick him under the table, uh, yeah, <laughs> several times in directors' meetings, because uh, um, he and this gets to you know the thing that, that about change also you know that that it, and Iger talked to us about this it was it was great I mean he was saying you know Steve judged people too quickly um, and that didn't change he always did that and. Um, he recounted a couple of examples of, of, you know, somebody coming into the board and making a presentation, and then afterwards, or right there at the meeting, Steve would say, you know, you should fire that guy now. He's useless. So, and he, and and Iger, Iger is such a steady presence in some ways that he was able to say, well, you know, so he's not good at that. You know, that's a fault of his. I can accept it with all the rest. Let's take some audience questions. This was one uh, I think that came up as we were talking about Bill Gates. How much did Bill Gates cooperate with you as you were writing the book? Oh, he was one of the first people we interviewed uh, because, well, I have a good relationship with him too. And so when he heard that we got the deal, and I, just, I just said, you know, someday it'd really be great to talk to you. He made time for us right away, and it was actually a really useful interview to have at first because it, it sort of set our expectations of what their actual friendship had become in the latter, latter years, which was all sort of under behind the curtain. You know, you didn't see this, but they had really become much closer and, and shared a lot more time than they ever had in the previous 25 years, and so uh, that helped. But also, Bill is a great interview too, and always very uh, blunt. It's not the word; he's candid. We'll put it that way. And so he was really kind of fun to talk to about. Okay, what's Steve good at? What was he bad at? And what what made him special? And what did you admire about him? And he was very open about all this. Mm -hmm. And he did a couple of great things. He stood up at one time, at one moment, and imitated Steve on the stage making a presentation. <laughs> So, which was so cool, and so he's up there, and he's and he's like, uh, oh, and then there's one more thing, and and he and he says, and I've just seen him do that four times backstage, and this is like it's all new, and then and then the the. Um, um, well, I've lost. Well, there's that. Uh, well, oh, well, then he told us. He said. He said. He said. You should call your book "Don't Try This at Home" because <laughs> <laughs> that's the scale of what he did. And the other thing he said was, he was like, you know, I talked to a lot of young entrepreneurs, and and um, and a lot of them want to be like Steve Jobs, and a lot of them have um, a lot of them have the a-hole side down. <laughs> 
It's just the genius part that they're missing. Yeah. He was great. <laughs> That's great. This one's, a, this one's a little personal. People like myself who work for Apple really miss being able to listen to his iconic voice. Would you ever consider releasing excerpts of the audio tapes? Sorry, the last part. Would you ever consider releasing excerpts of the audio tapes where you're actually having a conversation? We've talked about it. We've thought about it. it they need some work still. They're not all of them in the greatest shape. Uh, so that I'm not sure whether they would be reproducible in a, in a way that will, will be of much use to many people. But uh, we've talked about it, and we're still trying to figure out what the best way is to do that. But there's, there's so much there, and it really needs to be winnowed out because there are still things in there that I don't think really he would have wanted people to hear. So... Um, it's it just that's going to take some time because that takes uh, uh, some real judgment before we do that. I know a museum that's pretty good at that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 could you could come and curate that. it. <laughs> the Smithsonian of the West. That's right. More than just the West, Rick. It's okay. Like, it's You're fast. picking the questions, it's fast. right? I am. I'm picking the questions. Yeah, okay. uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses, both personally as well as professionally. What can we learn from Steve Jobs in terms of managing to recognize our strengths and minimizing our weaknesses? I, the thing that I, I've been asked um, on this, as we've been doing publicity, I've been asked a few times, like, what lessons can you learn from Steve Jobs' life? And the thing that the thing that impressed me most and surprised me most is the, Brent always talks about how he had amazing peripheral vision. Um, and he did, and he brought everything in. Everything could have an impact on his final decision. And it was it was really interesting for me as a journalist to listen to this because we live in an age of you know short form journalism and and quick answers and quick responses to everything and and you know so much of there's there's so much here that's built on your exit strategy and stuff like that and i and i found this this ability to take in information from all over the place and turn it into an opinion, into a decision. That was something to me, it's not a shortcut to success, but it was, it was a key to how he moved the company forward during these amazing years. It was not about, you know, his design taste or his, you know, or, or the particular metals, as Brent said. It was, it was you know, for somebody who, who could be so stubborn and could dismiss other people's opinions, he listened and he took it all in and he turned it into his own thing. And that, to me, was, was the, the thing that I was most impressed by. I mean, he really had the patience to take in so much. And he matured to the point where he could turn all of that into something new that felt right to him. Whereas in, as a young man, he also had per, good peripheral vision. But there were things that would go against what he thought, and he'd dismiss them. There, there are two other things that, that stand out to me. One, one is that he really was always willing to change his mind. He always seemed so adamant about this or that, and all oh, that shit, that's great. This, But the reality was he always reserved the right to change his mind. And, uh, and the reason he did that is that he understood something very fundamental about uh, all of the high-tech businesses, and that is that what what we call technology is really this sort of recombinant thing. It's when you take 
one existing technology and you find something new that you can add to that and it suddenly gives the whole thing more potential or can take you into some realm you could never have thought of before and it's just because you added this one thing to it. That's why his peripheral vision was so important because he could see that, oh, it's kind of like dropping uh, a, a, a reagent into a, into a chemical and poof, suddenly it's completely something, it's, it's a phase change happens. And he understood that if you pick things well, that can happen. Now, he used to think when he was younger that you had to do that every time on a great big scale that it was very, very dramatic. But you saw this over and over again, especially when he got back to Apple, where they just add one little element, you know, little, little solid state memory here that you couldn't have before, you know, or, or a different kind of uh, disk drive that this, oh, it's smaller. We could, hey, that could be a music player. Uh, but it's still, it's no different than any other recording medium, but it's just adding something new to something you already have that makes it qualitatively much different. So Steve was always looking for that. And to me, that's sort of what everybody in, in this community does. Mm. And he just had distilled it down, was, was, had perfected you know, the, the, the ability to pick the right things. So. I always like to ask the last question, and then we're going to have a reading. My last question is, this book illuminates a lot of the mystery of Steve Jobs that was out there before and is not out there anymore, thanks to you. But there must be one or two mysteries of Steve Jobs that you had to leave unsolved. And if you had to describe what those are, what do you think they would be? Wow. There's more than one or two. Uh, and that's what, you know, that, that's the thing is that um, I think that we, I, I certainly realized as we were going through this that, um, you know, this is a guy we're going to be writing about for a long time. Um, uh, Brent had a certain experience of him that was able to illuminate a part of his life in a way that, in a way, in a way that he changed. I mean, that's what we tried most of all. That really we felt hadn't been out there before. I think that there's going to be much more written about him um, that will get into things. It's you know the the solving mysteries thing to me is really um, a complicated thing because I don't believe in, in, in um, you know, like single source stories. Like, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was bipolar because of his adoption. I don't, you know, that's not a story that is satisfying in any way. And I, um, there probably will emerge more and more, I suspect, that will tell us even more about his character and the sides of his character. And, and that's what I think will happen over the years, is that information will emerge and we will get a more, an even more rounded portrait of him. I, um, there are two things. First of all, I still don't get why he built that boat. You know, it just really <laughs> doesn't yes. fit his personality, what I know of him, I, I, I mean, I think his family was even baffled by it a little bit. I mean, it's a beautiful boat, but then? And you know, it just seemed so weird that he would be doing that. But that's sort of a lighthearted bafflement. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I was also fascinated and never quite got to the bottom of this sort of spiritual side of his life. And what, what his experience in India was really like, what he really learned there, and, and then why he's, his interest turned more towards Buddhism, which is a little more of this world than Hinduism, and how that affected his, his uh, aesthetic judgment 
a lot of these things I kind of know, and I, I kind of got a feeling about it. But he, he wasn't the kind of person who would talk about this. And, and these are very personal things. So I don't think we'll ever really know quite how he truly felt about all this, other than that it was one of the reasons why his, it was a gyroscope for him. And it kept him very consistent and kept his standards very high and probably gave him made him feel okay about being such a jerk sometimes, too, because he was just so sure that he was doing things for the right reason. And that, to me, is the, uh, the mystery that just I don't think we really can answer now. Mm. So. Rick, you've got the book, and we've marked a passage yes. at the very back. <clears throat> um. The last memorial service occurred at the Apple campus in Cupertino on October 20. Nearly 10,000 people gathered on the lawn within the ellipse formed by the campus's main buildings. Every Apple retail outlet around the globe had been closed for the occasion, with the store employees gathered to watch video of the event streamed live to them over Apple's virtual network. Tim Cook was the first speaker. Coldplay and Nora Jones, whose music had been featured in Apple television advertisements, played short sets for the crowd. But two speakers provided the highlights, Johnny Ive and Bill Campbell, the Apple board member who'd been a close advisor of Steve for many, many years. Steve changed, said Campbell. Yes, he had been charismatic and passionate and brilliant, but I watched him become a great manager. He saw things others couldn't see. He dismissed as arrogant the tech leaders in the world who thought we were all stupid because we couldn't use these devices. He said, we're stupid if they can't use these devices. And then Campbell went on to address the Steve he had known personally. In the last seven and a half years, as he became more vulnerable, he made sure that those he loved those who were closest to him knew it. To those people, he exuded the phenomenal warmth and humor he shared. He was a true friend. Speaking later, I've too talked about friendship. He was my closest and most loyal friend. We worked together for 15 years, said the Brit, and he still laughed at the way I said aluminium. But mostly I've talked about work, the pleasures of work, and the pleasures of working specifically with Steve. Steve loved ideas and loved making stuff, and he treated the process of creativity with a rare and wonderful reverence. He, better than anyone, understood that while ideas ultimately can be so powerful, they begin as fragile, barely formed thoughts, so easily missed, so easily compromised, so easily just squished. His was a victory for beauty, for purity, and, as he would say, for giving a damn. The ceremony, which anyone can watch these days on their iMac or iPhone or iPad, or on their Samsung Galaxy or Microsoft Surface, if they prefer, was both sober and rousing. Look right, look left, look ahead of you and behind you, said Campbell. You're it. Results counted. You're the people who made it happen. It was an event that celebrated the past and that also made clear, as Steve would have, that there was much still to be done. We won't keep you too long, said Chris Martin, the lead singer of Coldplay, as they launched into a song to close the ceremony. We know Steve would want you to get back to work. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Brent Schlender and Rick Tetzelli. Right. Thank you so much. Really Such a pleasure. Thanks. That was really great. Thank you so much.